afternoon. My name is Brian D'Onofrio. I'm a professor and the director of clinical training in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences. And, and just quickly, uh, our department uh, down in Bloomington has been at the forefront of a new way of training for psychologists, where we train our students to beg, borrow, and steal the best advances from neighboring disciplines, and then help them try to apply those to clinical questions. Now, you might be asking, why in the world would I be talking with you about my department? Um, it's because I think Robert Gibbons is a great example of what we're trying to do for the field, which is taking some of the best advances, in this case, in terms of biostatistics, and applying this to major public health concerns, uh, in particular substance use problems uh, and mental health problems. Uh, before I do a formal introduction of Robert, I just want to do a, a couple of thank yous, uh, in particular uh, to Lori Losey, who uh, has been, is up here at the Regent Street, who's been instrumental uh, in the organization of this event, the publicity of this event. Um, I have administrative envy in terms of uh, capable people in holding major events, so Lori and that other people at the Regent Street, thank you for your generous hospitality. So I have the honor of introducing Robert. I can stand up here for an hour and tell you all the amazing things that he's done. Um, but he's used biostatistics and advances in statistics, many of those that he created himself and applied this to environmental monitoring, um, medicine generally, um, in terms of working with the National Academy of Sciences in the allocations of organs for transplant, um, pharmacoepidemiology and drug safety. He was on the FDA advisory board for the suicide and antidepressants and adolescence issue. Um, I'll let him tell perhaps over drinks whether or not he agreed or disagreed with the black box warning. Um, but today he's going to be talking about his return to what he worked on in graduate school, which is how can you take advances in statistics to best help in terms of the assessment of really complex issues. Numerous honors, lifetime achievements, awards from the American Statistical Association, American Public Health, Harvard, He's a fellow of the American Statistical Association and the members of the National Academy of Medicine and um, the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, so he's a rock star, um, but I would be remiss without also talking about it on a personal level. Um, I have been absolutely amazed also at his care and concern for his colleagues. Um, at one point in a dinner years ago, I mentioned dealing with a family medical problem. He went out of his way after dinner to track me down and make sure that things were okay. So not only has it been an honor in terms of great collaboration in terms of the science, um, but also in terms of interpersonality or interpersonal issues um, in terms of mentorship. So please uh, help me in welcome Robert. I am sure that you'll be uh, excited uh, to hear him talk. Thanks so much uh, for both of these wonderful uh, introductions. You should know in advance that statisticians are people who wanted to become accountants, but we didn't have the personality. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was trained at the University of Chicago in statistics under the guiding principle to never do anything remotely useful. <laughs> I, I hope at the end of this hour you believe that I'm a complete failure to my teachers. Uh, <clears throat> this has been a program of research that's been going on for a very long time, uh, starting really uh, with funding from the Department of Defense, uh, the Office of Naval Research, and personnel and guidance. They were trying to uh, use item response theory, unidimensional item response theory lifted from educational measurement to make personnel and guidance decisions of who should be an astronaut and who should be a cook. And they were applying them to complex traits that were clearly multidimensional, and so they were worried that they were sending astronauts into the kitchen and cooks into space. Uh, so using that as an excuse, we got them to give us a ton of money to develop multidimensional item response theory. And this work has progressed from that early work. I'm going to take you through a general sort of 30,000 foot overview of this work, why it's important, something about its statistical and scientific foundation, and just show you how rich the potential applications are to so many important areas. Um, so, one of the things I'm really interested in as a statistician is the science of measurement. 
And I started my work in the science of measurement and the development of statistical methods that are used to calibrate instruments in analytical chemistry and to do environmental monitoring and environmental chemistry. Um, and so measurement is really important. What is measurement? The standard definition of measurement is the process of obtaining the magnitude of a quantity relative to an agreed upon standard. That's dumb as a rock, because it assumes we have an agreed upon standard, and there are lots of really interesting things to measure, particularly in, in, in social and behavioral sciences, that we don't have an agreed upon standard. Uh, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. Albert Einstein said that, and you'll never be dinged for starting your lecture with a quote from Albert Einstein. Uh, Although, I actually like uh, Lincoln Moses. Lincoln Moses founded biostatistics at uh, Stanford University. Um, and, um, you know, if your last name is Moses, you got to name your kid Lincoln, right? <laughs> you know he's going to do great things. And, uh, and, and Lincoln used to say, you have to have a good data side manner to be a good applied statistician. And, and Lincoln Moses had a great data side manner. And what he said was, a statistic reports the outcome of the measurement process. And we must understand the process in order to understand the statistic. And, and there's something particularly profound about that idea in that uh, we as practicing statisticians, we have to learn something about the substance of what it is uh, that the person who's bringing it into Problem, perhaps in the mental health arena, uh, is uh, what it's really about. What are the underlying scientific principles? And what do the measures actually mean? I mean, there's good quality measurement, and then there's not so good quality measurement. Um, so here's an example from medical measurement. Uh, two examples. One is the, um, this is an fMRI study. There's a, uh, there's a, voxel in here uh, that is the subject of this uh, uh, hemodynamic response process. Uh, these are the observed uh, hemodynamic uh, blood oxygen levels. This is an event-related design. And this is a fitted curve, a low-degree polynomial, a third-degree polynomial that's simultaneously estimated in every voxel in the brain, brain based on a generalized linear mix effect model. These are the empirical Bayes estimates that are pieced together to reproduce the observed hemodynamic response. This is all going on simultaneously in one million boxes in the brain. This is very high tech. This is a very good example of very high quality measurement. This is not such a good example of high quality measurement, but it comes from a really, really smart guy whose office is upstairs, Kurt. <laughs> uh, this is the most widely used measure in mental health, the HQ2, and it is two questions, and everyone gets the same two questions, no matter whether or not you're suicidal or you're totally normal. Um, and, and it is what it is. As a statistician, receiving this information versus this information, I'm probably going to do the same kind of analysis, but I should really think about the measurement process much more. And so this, this talk today is really about measurement. It's about what, what can we do? So here's an example from the physical sciences. This is silver in parts per trillion. Um, so this is the true concentration, which we spike into distilled water, and we make it up by uh, just simply you know, uh, diluting a sample with a known amount of silver. And this is the measured concentration from a really, really good GC mass spec that, as you can see, is capable of measuring these things with a lot of precision down to parts per trillion. The bounds on this are statistical tolerance regions for a linear calibration curve that have this really disgusting looking formula. Uh, and they describe the uncertainty of the measurement process. The important thing to take home from this picture is that in analytical chemistry, Measurement is a simple, simple thing to do because I can spike the sample with a known amount of, of 
of a particular analyte, and I can see how well I recover. In measurement of the social and behavioral sciences, I don't have that luxury. I can't spike you with depression and see how well I can measure. All I know are the manifestations of that depression in terms of the crossing of thresholds of individual manifest items that may or may not tell me anything about the underlying disorder. Um, much of mental health practice is about those manifest items. In my mind, that's a really bad idea. The real important thing is to understand the latent variables that give rise to various patterns of those manifestations. And that's what the focus should be. And I want to measure those latent variables with, uh, with precision. And that's the hard part. And that's what this talk's all about. So what is theta? So my friend Steve Rautenbusch, when I gave a lecture at the University of Chicago about this many years ago, said, well, Ron, what is depression? I said, well, it's theta, right? It's that latent variable. Um, so in, in measurement of latent constructs, what we have is something that looks like a concentration on the x-axis, and they then the probability of response to a particular item in a test or a symptom in an inventory. And the more theta we have, the more depression we have, the greater the likelihood of getting a manifest response, which is positive or in a higher graded category. But we don't know what theta is. It's a latent variable. So the only way of knowing what it is is to infer something about it by giving lots and lots of questions, lots and lots of symptoms, so we can derive an inference in terms of the underlying latent variable. Not only it's mean, but also it's uncertain, it's precision. So we can characterize our uncertainty in the data. Statisticians don't know anything, but we're really good at characterizing our uncertainty. Why is this important? Well, the, the US suicide rate has, has, has just continued to skyrocket. We lose 45,000 people to suicide every year in the United States. The major depressive disorder is really one of the major causes of disability in the world, and particularly in the United States. It uh, affects 6.7% of the population per year, and depressed people have more medical symptoms, comorbidity, and physical health illness, poor treatment compliance, increased health care utilization and cost, less likely to receive preventive care, um, and, and also are, are largely in minority populations as well who have limited access to quality health care. Most identification is not in psychiatry, it's in primary care or pediatric or in emergency departments, largely with people who aren't trained to do these kinds of assessments. So we need tools that will help guide them to who should be looked at, who should be referred, what should you do, who's at risk of suicide. Most suicides are people who are depressed, but 95% of people who are depressed uh, are not suicidal. So it's hard to find, it's still a rare event, uh, but it's something that needs our attention. So in order to sort of bake this cake, we need to understand the difference between classical test theory, which is probably what most of you use in general. Uh, we have a series of items, and you add up the item scores, and that becomes your score, and that's what you use. That's classical test theory. Classical test theory is illustrated nicely by this example. I like to use examples for sports. Um, of, the high, of, the, of the hurdles. So, if I change the number of hurdles or the height of hurdles or the distance between the hurdles, I can no longer score uh, or, or, or compare the time it takes to run one race versus another. Classical test theory uh, is a lot like that. If I am doing a PHQ-9 and I really don't want to know anything about suicide, but then I have to figure out what to do with suicide, so I use the PHQ-8. The score of the PHQ-8 is not in the same metric as the PHQ-9, you really can't equate those two in a simple way. It's a limitation of classical test theory. That's not true of item response theory. Item response theory is a lot more like the high jump. The high jump of the items are the locations on the bar, uh, and, and your ability is measured in that same metric. It's the highest height that you can clear on the bar. This gentleman's good high jump will start about six and a half feet, and then he's going to move the bar about an inch in either direction, and then we'll have a pretty good estimate of visibility. I'm doing the high jump, I'm starting.
start to get a foot, I want to build up a little confidence, and by the time I hit four feet, I'm doing a base point. The important thing is not that I'm a curly high jumper. The important thing is that this gentleman and I are measured in exactly the same thing, despite the fact that neither one of us has taken any two items in, in, uh, in, in similarity. He's taken all his items at a really difficult level. I've taken all my items now at an easy level. That is one of the beauties of item response theory, and it opens the door to CAT, computerized adaptive testing. If we use that as a model-based measurement system, uh, then we can perform computerized adaptive testing because we free the specific items that are used to assess uh, the severity on the learning variable from our ability to estimate the ability or impairment uh, that the scale is trying to measure. So imagine you had a thousand item mathematics test ranging in difficulty from uh, arithmetic to advanced calculus. So now you have these two examinees, you've got this lovely fourth grader and one of my poor oppressed underfed graduate students of statistics at the University of Chicago. I could give each of them the thousand item test and I have a good estimate of their ability, but I really would have wasted their time uh, and I'm not sure they sit still long enough to take a thousand item test. Alternatively, I could give them the PHQ2 version of this test and ask them an arithmetic question and a calculus question. The child would get a score of one because got, she got the uh, arithmetic item right and my graduate student would get a score of two because he got both of the items right. And we come to the ridiculous conclusion that my graduate student has twice the mathematical ability as this fourth grader. We all know the fourth grader knows way more about math than my graduate <laughs> The problem is we've sacrificed the precision of measure for the speed of measure. A better approach would have been to start with an algebra item, and when the kid got it wrong, move to easier items, and when the graphics got right, move to more difficult items. That is computerized adaptive testing. Many of you sitting here have taken the GRE, which is a cat. It's a really bad cat, by the way, and it's also a cat based on unidimensional item response theory, which assumes that the underlying latent variable is a single variable. Well, it's not so bad for mathematical ability. It's essentially unidimensional. And all I really do need to do is give you adaptive items along a real line, and I can find your ability. But for a complex trait, like depression, where the items are sampled from different domains, like mood disorder, or cognitive impairment, or somatization, or suicidality, that produces a multi-dimensional structure, and I have to find my way around the k-dimensional space adaptively. I'm really good at doing that. I'm not really good at doing much else. And that's how you do it. You know, this is not rocket science. This is much easier than rocket science. I've done lots of rocket science. This is the bifactor restriction. This is the first confirmatory item factor analysis model, and it says that all the items load on the primary dimension no more than one subdomain. So maybe this is the subdomain of cognitive impairment, and this is somatic concerns for a four-item test, and all of them map onto this primary dimension that I'm calling depression. On the basis of this structure, I can estimate the parameters of this model, but tell me something about how difficult or how severe an item is. A suicide item is going to be way more severe than an item that says, do you feel sad? How well does the item actually discriminate high and low levels to the primary dimension? That's this parameter. And then how well does it discriminate the other secondary domains? What this allows me to do is to estimate the overall severity score, which is a very complex combination, convoluted function of all those different parameters integrated over the space of all of the different dimensions that are present in the model. Way more information than you ever wanted to know, but you're expected to teach this next class. Um, this is the posterior variance of that score. What does that mean? It's the uncertainty in the score. It's, the, it's, it's how much do I know about this? So in the everything that I'm going to show you, I'm not only going to estimate the severity of depression, I'm also going to characterize the uncertainty, and adaptively, I'm going to keep administering items until the uncertainty of my score on that 100-point scale is no more than five points. 
Well, all of a sudden, I've created a homeless compassion world where everybody is measured to exactly the same level of precision. No existing mental health measurement system comes close to being able to do that. As you can see, we've been at this for a while. The first paper on the statistical theory of this was published long before most of you were born. Um, and it took me a long time just to get around to publishing the thing, so I, I won't admit to when I started doing it. But I will tell you that I was only four years old. <laughs> so <laughs> traditional measurement, all subjects get all items. And cat, different subjects get different items based on their severity. We want to pick the smallest number of items for a fixed level of precision. Five points on a 100 point scale isn't bad. The shift in paradigm is from trying to come up with a really small number of items that are kind of the best items we have available, to starting with a huge bank of items, thousands of potential items that, that really characterize every little hiccup along that entire continuum at every level of severity. And then from that, dynamically select a very small and manageable set of items that extracts and preserves the information from the total bank. I want to pick 10 items out of a 400 item bank, but I want my 10 item score to be correlated at least 0.95 with that 400 item bank score. So the analogy to the PHQ is I, create, I want to create the PHQ 400 that takes me the same amount of time to administer as the PHQ 9, I want to have over 40 times the amount of precision and information in that score, but I don't want to burden people any more than a short form test. So we want to maximize precision and minimize burden. So the paradigm shift, well, I've kind of done this already. So here are the results from our first study. We've been continuously funded for it, and just a disgustingly large amount of money from the National Institute of Mental Health for over the last 15 years to develop a wide variety of tests based on this technology and also to, make, to develop the technology in the first place. So for depression, with a standard error of 0.3 on an underlying normal, that's about five points on a 100 point scale, we're able to maintain a correlation of 0.95 with a 389 item test score using an average of 12 items typically in less than two minutes anywhere on the planet, on your cell phone or on any other internet capable device. If we want to do psychiatric epidemiology and we want to screen everybody in the state of Indiana, we might relax it a little bit, go down to seven points of precision. Now we're down to six questions on average to be administered. Very similar results for anxiety and for uh, mania and hypomania, underlying bipolar. Diagnosis and measurement are fundamentally different things. As you now know, for measurement, you want to bring the items to the severity level of the person, which I'm going to learn dynamically by giving them items and, and, and computing theta hat one every time I administer uh, an item. For diagnosis, I want to put those items right at the tipping point between a positive and a negative diagnosis so that I can I can really get the best classification for it. So while for measurement I use multidimensional item response theory, for classification where I have an external criteria, maybe a skin-based DSM-5 diagnosis of major depressive disorder, I want to use machine learning kinds of methods. I care about prediction. I care about hitting that target. I'm not so sure the target of a DSM-5 MDD diagnosis is the best thing in the world, but it's the best thing I have to work with at the moment. I'm not sure machine learning is the best thing in the world, but it's the best thing for hitting targets. So we use a low-dimensional um, projection of a high-dimensional random forest to a low-dimensional decision tree. And this is a decision tree with six nodes. It takes an average of 36 seconds to administer. Uh, and on the basis of four uh, as a median and six as a maximum item administration, we can maintain sensitivity of 0.95 and specificity of 0.87 for an hour long face-to-face -face clinical diagnosis. There is nothing remotely like that, irrespective of the number of, of items administered. In fact, two clinicians rating the same patient twice won't be able to agree the two to approach that. We've done an independent validation study, lots of them. 
now, and they all validate and cross-validate. But importantly, in this study, we actually asked people whether or not they liked it, something that a statistician would never think of doing. 97% accurately said it accurately reflected their mood, 86% compute, preferred the computer interface. Interestingly, not age dependent. 97% uh, said they were comfortable, and 98% said they answered honestly. So how does this work? We start with a huge item bank, and we select an item in the middle of the distribution, uh, medium severity. On the basis of the response to that item, we compute those horrific looking equations off in a server, an Amazon Web Services, you know, wherever that is, it's probably some satellite revolving around the Earth. Um, and on the basis of that score, and its uncertainty, we now go out and pick the maximum informative item left in the 388 items that we have to administer. We administer that item, get the, get the response, rescore, and continue that process iteratively until that posterior standard deviation, or certainly in our score, drops below five points on a 100 point scale. So everybody is measured to the same degree of precision. So what are the advantages? Well, after adaptive administration of approximately 10 items in two minutes, we obtain the same level of precision that we would have from the administration of hundreds of items. And our computerized adaptive diagnostic students can reproduce structured clinical interviews that last hours. So the idea of you know, sending a kid off for an eight-hour assessment uh, is maybe not the best way to spend clinicians' time. We can, we can do this in a couple of minutes. <laughs> different people get different items upon repeat administration, so we no longer have the response biases associated with repeated administration of the same set of items over and over and over again. This opens the door to high frequency or intensive longitudinal data. We can now do moment, ecological momentary assessments using really high quality, high precision measurements. And these systems are cloud-based, so they can be used anywhere in the world. Right now, while I'm giving this talk, we're administering them uh, in Nigeria and India and Spain and various other places around the world in different languages. So what can it do? Well, it can do lots of things. In about six minutes, we can screen for and measure the severity of depression and anxiety mania, hypomania, PTSD, and suicidality and substance abuse in adults, and measure the severity of these disorders, determine the need for treatment and the type of treatment that's required, and provide measurement-based treatment in or out of the clinic. Why wait for someone to come in, which they may not even come in to assess whether or not they're benefiting from treatment, when we can send them an email or a text message and get information about changes in the severity of their illness, wherever they are in or out of the clinic. Um, most of this here about. So why is this important? Well, we did this little study with a bunch of uh, undergrads at the University of Chicago who really wanted to go to medical school, get a bachelor. And they wanted to participate in the research studies. They can get a letter of recommendation. So Dave Beiser, uh, one of the heads of the emergency department, uh, enrolled a small army of them. And very rapidly, we screened 1,000 people who came to the emergency department for a non-psychiatric indication. 22% of these people came in for a broken ankle and stuff like that. Screened positive major depressive disorder with 90% or greater confidence. But only 7% of them were really at the moderate to severe level in terms of their severity in need of um, immediate face-to-face -face psychotherapy and or pharmacotherapy. More frighteningly, 3% of them had a serious suicide warning based on not only ideation, but also intent, plan, or recent suicidal behavior. Not one of those 30 people, the 3% of 1,000, were detected by the emergency department staff. Those people in that 7% category had a 300% increase in emergency department visits and a 400% increase in hospitalization. So the cost of untreated and undiagnosed depression to our healthcare system is enormous. And these are not psychiatric hospitalizations or psychiatric diseases. These are for physical health problems. 
we see very similar results in people who are these in other cultures. For example, Latinos taking this uh, in Spain, Barcelona, Madrid, and various Latino populations around the US taking these tests in Spain. What if you could assess treatment response every single day? Well, of course you can, and people will do it because they're not getting the same questions over and over again. So here's a really sad case. This is a person who had really treatment resistant depression. She failed 30 courses of antidepressants and eight courses of ECT and received deep brain stimulation uh, for her treatment resistant depression. On a 100 point scale, this was really her kind of her maximum. <coughs> repeated it back over here. Um, and then these were a series of measurements that were taken using the CADMH while she was uh, in the middle of her neurosurgery. The neurosurgeon was implanting electrodes in her brain and she was answering the CADMH. She did it three times. And remarkably, in the course of her surgery, she was cured. <laughs> but then she got worse, and then she got better, and then she got worse and plateaued for a while. The dynamics of depression are remarkable. There are tremendous variability. And this isn't random variability. There are periods or epochs of, of, of time where the level is fairly stable. And again, the variation we're seeing is about five points on a 100 point scale. That should remind you of the posterior standard deviation that these tests were designed to, to measure. And then towards the end, they started titrating for treatment. Uh, to the elect amount of electrical stimulation based on the CADMH, and there we're starting to see some progression. If you only looked at the Hamilton Depression Scale that was administered three times for six months, you see that, oh, she's linearly improving. Well, there was anything but linearity in her, her treatment trajectory. These are 94 repeated measurements over a course of six months. She wasn't paid to do this. She just got an email from once a day saying, click here, take it to our servers, assess, and the results push back to the clinicians. And what you can really tell from this slide is that I'm like a fourth grader drawing all over the slide in a real sloppy way. Differential item functioning. Are there cultural and language differences in the experience of mental health disorder? So we've developed the technology to identify those items that may work really well in a psychiatric population or may not work in the, well in another, pot, in another culture or in another indication. We've done this um, with the Spanish cat study, uh, looking at people taking this uh, from, you know, taking these tests in Spanish in different cultures. We've done this for perinatal depression. We've identified those questions that don't work in pregnant women. Um, you, you can imagine a question about fatigue, which is a good somatic indication of depression, doesn't work at all in pregnant or postpartum women. It has nothing to do with depression. It has to do with the fact that you've got this bowling ball in your stuff. You just gave birth. Um, what about somatization in emergency departments? Does that matter? Do we have to come up with a separate cat for everything? The answer here is no. Our 1,008 item bank work just fine in the emergency department. We can find any differential item function, despite all of these somatic issues. We've also developed a, uh, a, a child version of all this called the kitty cat. And we did this with David Brent, uh, the, the, the clinical PI on the, on the stuff I've shown you today. It's David Cuffer, who's the former chair of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of, Pitt, University of Pittsburgh and the head of DSM-5. David Brent is our, one of our nation's leading child psychiatrists. And we developed a 2,400 item bank, 1,200 items for the parent rating of the child, 1,200 items for the child rating themselves. We're measuring depression, anxiety, mania, ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, suicidality. It takes the parent five minutes to extract the information from their 1,200 items and seven minutes for the child. So within seven minutes, we can get this wonderful profile of all of these different areas of psychopathology that can help guide a pediatrician or someone in a pediatric emergency department to make an appropriate referral, including risk of suicide. And we validated all of this. In fact, we finished the validation about two weeks ago, and the results are just breathtaking. Um, using the case ads, using 600 parent-child 
for any one of the 45 diagnoses in the case that we have ABC of 0.9 using this combination of the different child and parent measures. And we get the same level of sensitivity and specificity for the individual diagnoses. So we can both predict diagnoses and we can also um, characterize the severity of these illnesses. For suicidality, we can re reproduce a 30-minute structured clinical interview with an ABC of 0.996. I mean, things like that shouldn't happen in nature. So these are, are just some of the <coughs> results. This is what an AUC of 0.996 actually is. It means that, you know, just you never need to do the diagnosis. So what can we measure? In adults, in English and Spanish, right now we can measure depression, anxiety, mania, hypomania, suicidality, substance misuse, and PTSD. We have developed psychosis measures, but if to guide a clinician adaptively in acquiring information and also self-report, which we're now validating in the field to see whether or not you really can get uh, self-reports of psychosis or to within what bounds uh, you can get it. That work's being done by John Kane at Hillside Hospital. Uh, we've also developed quality of life measures and functional status and well-being measures for both thyroid cancer patients and survivors in particular, but cancer patients in general. Our perinatal optimized me measures are for depression, anxiety, mania, and hypomania, and I've talked about the CAT. What are some of the uses of the CAT in it? The state of Tennessee, we've just trained 300 case workers. So this is the first time in child welfare that kids in foster care, juvenile justice, and detention centers are actually getting screened for a multitude of psychiatric disorders and suicide risk and are actually getting treatment directly based on that screening. We just screened 1,300 people in the Cook County Bond Court. Um, Cook County Bond Court, Cook County Jail, to identify people who are suffering from mental health disorders so that they don't just keep revolving through the door of the Cook County Jail and then they come back in jail. We can do this effectively. But part of it, these folks are, are just about to go see the judge and they're being screened for, you know, opioid addiction and heroin and a variety of other things. And they're, they seem to be responding honestly because we're reproducing the same rates that we're seeing based on urinalysis. Um, UCLA, we've done a couple of really interesting projects. We've just finished, well, it's, it's an ongoing project, where we screened the entire freshman class at UCLA uh, for depression, anxiety, and suicide. Suicide risk is 4%. It's a serious suicide risk. Um, those kids who are in the mild to moderate range were immediately uh, put into a program of internet cognitive behavior therapy. It's going to be 3 o'clock in the morning. These kids are doing really well. Those who had suicide risk were immediately sent to the emergency department uh, and or uh, a um, uh, suicide hotline. And those who were in severe depression and anxiety groups uh, were sent to either the emergency department or student health or, uh, or psychiatry, depending on the hour. Uh, so here's an example of, of, of sort of blending screening and measurement with a variety of different treatment modalities. The majority of these kids were screened, treated, and monitored for the effectiveness of this treatment without any human contact. And many of these cases were in the middle of the night. So kudos to UCLA for having the courage to do this. There's some cool media attention to this in NBC and Fox. Um, although I only looked at the NBC. Uh, we can screen we're screening 1.8 million people in the Los Angeles area to develop a registry of 100,000 patients uh, that are going to be followed for a decade in terms of their genetics and various omic measures and changes in the, in, in the severity of their illnesses. Um, at Indiana University here, uh, the Substance Abuse Grand Challenge with Brian and his colleagues, uh, Bernice Pescado Salido is doing a statewide survey of uh, substance abuse disorder 
and has hired the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago, who has embedded the Cavendish by hitting our API directly, so it's an automatic generation of these tests, right in the middle of the survey. So that's ongoing. And of course, all of the conversations and the development they've been running me through for the last two days uh, on wonderful applications in the Department of Justice and uh, psychiatry and the emergency department and integrated primary and behavioral health care and a bunch of other things I can't even remember. Veterans Administration, we're working with folks in the VA uh, to uh, develop a new PTSD scale and improve PTSD scale, both for a binary classification, a diagnostic screener, and a dimensional severity measure, and further validation of our suicide scale. I was a special advisor to Secretary Shokin on these issues, and he got fired, so the answer is never hire me as a special advisor. <laughs> uh, the University of Pittsburgh, we talked about the Kitty Cat Project. We also are now developing even a further improvement of our suicide scale by combining it with natural language processing on the electronic health record to see if there are other sort of machine learning algorithms that we can apply to get additional information. That in and of itself is definitely not enough, but combined with good symptomologic uh, assessment and good measurement may be better than either one individually. Um, a little bit in the next couple of minutes uh, to tell you sort of what this looks like and what we do with it. You know, it, you think that you build a better mouse trap and everybody in the world is just going to come and start using it. Wrong. It doesn't work like that. There's this whole implementation science thing that, that you know, is really, really important. I don't know if implementation science is important, but implementation is really important. And, and one of the things you need to do is you need to make these things accessible. You're not going to have docs, you know, going to your server and checking in and, and putting in another password and firing up some engine to administer a test. It has to be integrated in a seamless way in their clinical workflow. Uh, so at the University of Chicago, Nito Latirapal, a wonderful young uh, internal medicine doc, got a, an art grant to integrate the CADMH into Epic. And there are so many different choice points along the way, and HIPAA issues, and issues about what can hit an electronic health record system from the internet and can't. But this, uh, this un unintelligible graphic essentially lays out a schematic of what we're doing there, and we're trying to do it in a way that makes it transportable to other institutions. Um, why do I have the Cook County Bond Court slide in here? Uh, anyhow, I kind of told you about that. Uh, well, this is a diff study that shows that uh, after removal of nine items that showed bias, mostly items about sleep disturbance and anxiety, which you would go to if you're about ready to go to the Cook County Jail. I've been to the Cook County Jail many times, and I score high on anxiety when I go here to the place. We're able to reproduce the measurements using the original calibrations with almost perfect accuracy. So showing that they're, you know, we've eliminated the differential item functioning. This is the UCLA Grand Depression Challenge. Um, and again, we're, we're using ICBT for those in the mild to moderate group. And the other piece of this is we're also using peer counseling. So there's a group of UCLA students that are peer counselors for those that are identified um, with, with uh, mental health disorders. And these are just examples of the academies they put it into this system and feedback to the to the student about you had mild depression, your score was 62, here's where you line up with the rest of the new race. And this is an example of what the front end of the academy looks like. And so uh, I think you can see that. So we can decide uh, for a given individual for an entire healthcare system and what we're going to administer. Uh, either in English or Spanish, in general population or in the perinatal population. We can look at screener for major depressive disorder, measure the severity of depression, do it conditionally, that we only go and get the additional items we need to get severity in those people who have screened positive for major depressive disorder. So for 80 to 90% of the people, they're done in 36 seconds. 
For the other 20%, it takes two minutes. Anxiety disorder, mania, hypomania, substance use disorder, post-traumatic stress. This is a form that we're using to further optimize the CAD MVP for primary care populations, psychosis clinical, psychosis self-report, a brief suicide scale, an adaptive suicide scale. And these are the two scales that we developed, which are suicide risk predictor, prediction calculators for the ED star study, study of a large network of emergency departments. Cheryl King and David Brent are the PIs of that study. Um, and, and that study has just collected about 4,000 subjects. And we're doing the final validations. The results are remarkable in terms of how well we can predict future suicidal behavior of kids based on the tumor. This is kind of a messy slide, but it, it, it shows you sort of the etiology of testing. Um, this is an email that's sent to a subject, and you say click here, and if you click there, you'll get the test. In this case, I generated a suicide warning, so there was not only ideation, but there was also intent or plan. The suicide warning was sent to the clinician, but it's a text and an email, and potentially another 10 or 15 people within the healthcare system to alert them to it. This is an email or text that came describing the results of the test. So in this case, major depressive disorder was positive with 99.3% confidence. The score was 86.3, putting them in the severe category. Uh, anxiety was also severe, but mania and hypomania was normal, probably really not bipolar disorder. And in terms of substance use, the overall substance use to disorder severity was in the high risk, was 85 on a 100 point scale. And the issues were for alcohol and opioids. Um, and then this is going to the clinician portal and reproducing the results of the, the same information. And this is now a drill down on the depression test that the clinician can look at. And if you click on each one of these items, you can actually see what question was asked and what answer was given. And this is what CAT is doing. So we started out with a score with an uncertainty of about 11 points on a 100 point scale. After nine items, we dropped below six. Uh, and then after 13 items, we drop below five. And that's our final score of 86.3 in the severe category. That's essentially how CAT works. This person was in the severe group, 86.3. The uncertainty was 4.8 on the 86.3. So if I'm a clinician and I take this person from an 86 down to an 83, and I'm going, hey, I'm pretty good. No, you're not. That's with the noise. That's the uncertainty in the distribution. If I take them from an 86 down to a 76, I move them to sigma. Now I am pretty good. Probability of major depressive disorder for this person is 99.9% .9 given that they had that high score. And their percentile among clinician documented cases of major depressive disorder is about the 93rd percentile. Um, the final slide is a scheduler. This was developed for the department of OBGYN, and we set a time for the delivery date and can send emails or texts with the tests every week before for 14 weeks or 20 weeks during pregnancy and 27 weeks weekly assessments after pregnancy to identify the earliest onset of perinatal depression so it can be treated before it becomes a large problem. We spend billions of dollars on biological measurements and, uh, and genetic testing, yet we validate them using Stone Age clinical measurements. Florence Nightingale said, Statistics is the most important science in the whole world, for upon it depends the practical application of every other science and of every art. You start your lecture with Albert Einstein, and you always <laughs> end your lecture with Florence Nightingale. Thank you very much. So I can really see the advantage of the cat, for example, with where you 
location. We have large severity ranges from a broken finger to a coma. With depression, I, I love and I'm sure that you are incorporating multiple dimensions, and I'm not weighing in on whether one would want to set somatic or not, but one ought to know that the reason you wouldn't get somatic items out of the promises was that you use unidimensional IRT models, whereas you, which are multiple dimensional, so um, I'm wondering with the test that you, I imagine you probably have move your somatic cog uh, cognitive suicidality, but let's take move in particular. If I was a clinician and I asked you, okay, what's the trade-off? I'm thinking about giving a fixed item um, uh, uh, mood scale, uh, or let's say a, a, a fixed item. Let's go with the P29 because it has some matter. And you tell me, well, we should do CAT. Um, uh, is there a sense in which your items, I guess, whether in depression, whether the mood or otherwise, are they similar types of items that are out there legacy? Or do they somehow tap into these um, uh, 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 discrimination by asking, say, on a wider item response format to get more of the severity? Um, yeah, good question. So the, the, the question is about, um, it's about a lot of things, but it's, it's about the difference really between cat and multidimensional IRT versus cat and unidimensional IRT versus fixed length kinds of tests and, and how do the items, how do the information enter it? So that at the most basic level, but let's take promise depression, for example. So promise is is IRT based, which is really good. And they also develop cats, but it's all based on unidimensional IRT. So they actually for depression started out with a 300 item bank. I know this because Paul Pocotis was on both studies, uh, our study and theirs. And they ended up with this unidimensional constraint coming up with an item bank that only had 26 items in it. We started with a bank of 430 items, and because we allowed for multidimensionality, we were able to retain 389 items in the bank. So the numbers of somatic items, and the numbers of mood items, and the number of cognitive items that we have in the bank are really, really large. They're much larger than the entire bank of items, each one of those that are used in promise, and of course, many times larger than the handful of somatic items that might be on the, on, on the PHQ-9. And they're also exchangeable, statistically. Some of them are more severe than other, and on basis of the adaptive assessment, we can give either the less severe items, somatic items, or the more severe somatic items, because they're all projected to that primary dimension as well. Just, Hopefully that's sort of an answer. That was perfect. And just a follow-up question, and I won't monopolize with these very stat questions. But, um, uh, have you done any simulation studies, or, or has anyone, to say, okay, well, uh, with your, let's take a P29 versus your CAT. Um, so you have increased precision, or another way to say comparable precision with fewer items. But if you take the fact that if you give people different items, they're not exactly comparable. They're only exactly comparable with the IRT model. It's a population assumption, so there's no model that does. So the question is, how, is it useful compared to the violation, the degree of violation? So the question is, in particular, for within a person... You sound like Darth Vader. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In particular, for the longitudinal and the person being measured over time, have you done any simulations to show is that increased precision uh, that you get, is that, uh, how does that compare with the bias, say, of a fixed item four, I promise, or a uh, nine item piece to nine, with your, with a cap score bias for a person measured at one point and then to the next point? So this is a really good question. So early on, you know, it's like, well, this is a really cool technology, but because you're asking different questions upon repeat administration, your test retest reliability is going to go down because you're, you know, as opposed to a test that's asking the same question. In fact, the opposite happens. So we have a paper where we compared the PHQ-9 in terms of test retest reliability, which has good test retest reliability, it's about 0.8, to the CAT, and our hope was that the CAT would be comparable. The test retest reliability on the CAT depression was 0.92, despite the fact we're asking different questions. And the reason is, is that we're characterizing the latent variable with so much more precision. So despite 
the different questions, they are statistically exchangeable in terms of measuring that high jump. And the precision of measurement is overwhelming the, the effect of asking different questions. Also, in terms of longitudinal measurements, we've included these at the tail end of John Mann's Ketamine study. John Mann and Mike Rudolph at uh, Columbia did a randomized controlled trial of ketamine versus some other drug I can't pronounce. And they were using the Hamilton Depression Scale, clinician rated scale, and the Beck Suicide Scale, the short-term study with a six-week follow-up. We were finding in a sample, just the tail end of the study, of 22 people who we tested with the CAT DI, the Depression Scale, and the Suicide Scale, statistically significant differences between ketamine and its comparator, whereas the HAMD or the VEC could not find those differences. So, self-report versus clinician report, but because we're building in precision of measurement, the empirical standard deviation was smaller, and so the effect size was much larger. Any questions about the posterior variance of data? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I <laughs> so for the longitudinal administration of the CAT, is each assessment adaptable? So for example, when I take it the third time, is it do I sort of start at a place based on my second? Or is there is each time is the adaptability only within each assessment rather than over time? You Hoosiers are really smart. That's a great question. <laughs> the uh, the, so, in theory and in practice, we can actually, we start in the middle of the distribution because we have no prior. We don't know. But once you've taken it one time, we can start theta before we ever administer the second first item and adapt from there. Our platforms aren't sophisticated enough yet to tie that information together, but it's very much a high priority for us to use that background information to choose the best estimate we have of where to start the CAD on the second session, which is where we ended the CAD on the first session. So in that example I showed you, I would want to start the CAD at an 88 rather than a 50. Great question. Yeah? So we'll see if this works. Okay. So let's think about comorbidity. Better. Right, Ben. Um, so I think this is a great tool in terms of screening, ER, hospital, jail, the like. How is it implemented in screening in a health center when comorbidities are par for the course? How does that kind of guide treatment and how do therapists use this to kind of guide that treatment modality? Another good question. The, that validation, that external validation study I showed you, that was uh, done at. Uh, Oh, um, I can't remember the name of the place, but it's, it's, it's a Christian mental health center. It turns out to be the fifth largest mental health center. Pine Rest. Pine Rest, thank you. Um, and it's in Michigan, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And it, this was a, a group that had incredible comorbidities. And we were able to still pick out the disorders and measure them with precision, even in the presence of all of those comorbidities. And then this yeah, so if you think about the multivariate profile across all of these, these are very important indicators for decisions about treatment. Bless you. If, if, if mania is really high and depression is really high, the next step is for the clinician to really dig in more deeply and understand whether or not there's an issue of bipolar disorder. So there, it's still a really, it's an important tool for the clinician, but it certainly doesn't end the role of the clinician or simply relegate the role of the clinician to just treat it is used as a first step to sort of say, where should I focus my attention in a more focused assessment that will lead me to uh, ultimately a treatment decision. But at the same time, there are red flags. You know, someone who is suicidal, we're going to pick that up with accuracy. Somebody who has severe depression, uh, comorbid with anxiety. Some of the more nuanced things, so you've got severe depression, you've got anxiety, but PTSD is really high. We need to find out what's going on with that kind of life. For that, for that um, if you had a range of, say, 7 to 22 items in one of your examples mm -hmm. to get a certain precision, have you found that those people who need more items to get that precision, is there something about them that they tend to be, are they even more severe, uh, or are they just sort of offers that they have? 
have a lot of um, right, right. They're they're just more annoying. They <laughs> 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 yeah, want to get away with five They're more variable in their responses. So they're you know we, we think we've got them, and then you know all of a sudden they answer a question very severely. So it now redirects uh, the adaptive testing to a higher end of the distribution. Turns out. The really severe people are very easy to assess. We don't need a lot of items because they bump up. And, and, and you know, we know they're really severe. We, we run out of information for them, even in large banks. The people don't really have much of anything. The trickiest ones, the ones that are the 22, are people who will go 10 items in a row with the lowest category of nothing, and all of a sudden they'll put in a three. Cat really doesn't like that. It's going to take you a long time. Uh, you alluded to um, repeated measurement. Uh, I guess I'm referring to fixed length uh, measurements or, or instruments, and that you could potentially introduce some bias. The respondent would learn responses, and that could introduce some bias uh, related to that. Can you, can you, in a way, quantify how much that is a problem or how much bias might be introduced if you have? say outcomes at baseline three, six, nine months, and then your fixed length outcomes are repeated, you know, the same same battery of instruments are repeated over those times. I don't think the bias is going to be terrible if you have that kind of a separation and measurement. I think the bias is going to be bad if you're trying to do weekly assessments or you know the typical kind of randomized control trial first four weeks and then you know eight weeks and so forth. That's where you're going to get because people will recall how they answered the question and, and fall back to that. You'll see it in the data because you'll see very flat response curves. You'll see that people are just responding. They get into this probabilistic rut uh, of their responses. You're not seeing the variability that you want to see in, in those responses. And again, the, the big issue is are you sacrificing test retest reliability uh, for the ability to exchange the items over time? And the answer empirically is no. Uh, the biggest problem with the fixed length tests is that they lack the precision of measurement and they can lead to response bias for more intensive longitudinal measurements. Three months, six months, nine months. I don't think that's a real problem. Robert? Yeah, I think that's a brilliant work and a really an outstanding lecture. Thank you, thank you very much. You. Uh, I'm thinking back to just clinical interviewing. And the reliability of the reporter becomes very important. Um, the reporting of the data sometimes is not, um, I'll say, valid. We'll be interviewing a young person with a psychiatric disorder, and the parents might be in the room, and we're getting responses. And then we turn to the parents and say, what's your perspective? And we get a very different perspective. Um, and some, some individuals with psychiatric diseases do not have tremendous insight. So the response to a question with somebody with poor insight might be ostensibly less valid. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you cope with those factors? Well, you're, you're, you're touching on a lot of different issues. Um, so in kids, you know, the, the lack of congruency between parent reports of the child and the child's own report, particularly for things like conduct disorder. Kids with conduct disorder don't think there's anything wrong with their conduct. <laughs> You know, we all act like this, it's fine. And the parent is very concerned about it. So the correlation between parent reports and child reports are not very good. They're about 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Nevertheless, the information combined between the child's representation and the parent's representation of the kid's symptomatology happens to work really, really well for the prediction of clinical diagnoses made by trained clinicians doing clinical interviews, for example, in the case SADS. Uh, so I, I, I think that sort of gets incorporated. Now, people who don't have a lot of insight, those folks are going to respond in a very, in a very way. On those symptoms that they just don't quite get it, they're in case they have no problem in those symptoms, some of the somatic symptoms, they may go, you know, yeah, I do have problems sleeping and stuff. That's going to take CAT a little longer to be able to find the right items for them until they converge. And CAT will continue to do that until it does it. It'll do the best that it can with it. And then, and then finally, um, the, the, 
There was one other issue. Um, the, you know, it's hard enough for me to remember two questions, but the third is, uh, is a little tough. But, but in general, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the answer. So Robert, um, I just want to take this opportunity. Let's thank Robert. Uh,